Welcome to worship. We're glad to have you here with us. I invite you to rise as you're able as we begin our service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our call to worship is from Isaiah chapter 12. In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Amen. Let's, let's sing together as we worship, singing the well and the way. What a beautiful truth that we get to celebrate, that God first loved us and we come into worship as a response to his great love. Whether you know it or not, he drew you here tonight for a reason. He drew you here to hear a message of hope, a message of salvation, and to celebrate together with other people, be unified around the cross of Jesus and what it means for us as his sons and daughters. Amen? Amen. Yeah, it's okay to say it out loud. Amen? Thank you. All right. We may not be Baptist or Southern or anything like that, but we can say amen. All right. I'm Dan. Welcome. We are glad to have you here. It's a privilege to be in worship with you 
tonight. A few things to let you know about happening here in the life of our church. The women's retreat registration is still open, happening February 5th through the 7th. Uh, Great opportunity to get away from home, get out to Inspiration Point at the Twin Oaks campus and learn what it means to be content in Christ. And we have women from our congregation um, who are going to be teaching that weekend. Really excited. I wish I could be there, even though I'm not a woman. Like, it sounds like fantastic content. So ladies, get there, take good notes, and let me know how it goes. Uh, So there is a table in the foyer, and they have a little pamphlet here that uh, will tell you everything you need to know about the retreat. Um, I'm not going to read it. That would take way too long, um, and I won't, I'll get something wrong. So uh, pick one up if you're interested. It's in the north wall of our foyer as you leave. So please uh, look at that, ladies. And also, uh, women's Bible study is beginning tomorrow morning, and I talked to Jerry today, and she said, absolutely, walk-ins are welcome. Don't have to register. You can um, give them all the information they need when you get there in the morning. What time is it at? I don't, that's one thing I didn't ask. Anyone know? Thank you. Nine o'clock, women's Bible study right here at our East Campus tomorrow morning. Thanks. Uh, the other thing to let you know about is we are hosting a J-term, which kind of like if you think about an academic world, there's a J-term um, for our Sunday school classes on Sunday mornings. I realize we're, on, we're here on Wednesday night, and you're like, why are you talking about Sunday? Well, there have been people in the past who worship on Wednesday night and come to Sunday school on Sunday morning. And so if that's something you're interested in, we do have a brand new uh, way of doing, or a brand new slate offerings of classes for Sunday school come after January, but we have three weeks left of J term here this month. So check it out if you're interested. And the other thing to invite you to would be a week from Sunday night is our worship and prayer night. We've done two of them, one in November, one in December, and we just really feel a call to make space for uh, God's people to come together and commune with the Lord through worship, prayer, and selected scripture reading. So that's a pretty simple night, um, and that one in a week from Sunday will be happening at our West Campus. Be on the lookout for more information about that. All right, we're going to shift gears into giving and talk about what generosity means and how the scriptures teach us what it means. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 teaches us that generosity is a grace gift. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, we see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in this place tonight, to be lifting up our eyes to you, off of our circumstances and off of the craziness that we find ourselves in. May you give us even just a glimpse of rest tonight, a glimpse of hope that comes from you alone. Convict us where we're proud and comfort us where we are mourning, Lord. You see each of us and you know each of us, and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move in ways that we sense tonight, both in our minds and in our hearts. And Lord, as we respond to your self-giving love through generosity tonight, Lord, um, we ask that you would do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine, and that you continue to teach us and shape us into a generous people who hold tightly to you and loosely to the material things of this world. Pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading tonight uh, comes from Matthew chapter 28. We're going to read this because tonight we're talking about uh, the nations, the call to the nations. And this is Jesus' great commission at the end, very end of the gospel of Matthew and kind of his charge to his disciples. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Do you rise as you're able as we continue in worship?
many His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins they are made of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins they are many His mercy is more Our sins they are many His mercy is more and that's the best news ever. <laughs> Thanks for that. You guys. Hey, I'm so glad that you're here tonight. In January, we just take a, 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 a time to stop as a church and remember God's call on our lives, what it looks like when we're, when we're, uh, when we're uh, going with him and the work that he's given us. And we think about his impact on hearts, homes, and cities as the life and message of Jesus is proclaimed. We also realize that's something that he has called us to do across the street, but also across the world. And that's why during the month of January, we see these reminders of the different beautiful people that are on God's heart. And, and so we're thinking about that tonight. Specifically, uh, the Church of the Lutheran Brethren is not a very big uh, national church here. Maybe, we maybe have a hundred churches, but God has given us an important work in the Great Commission that Dan read about, and that's to take the gospel to the nations. We have no idea how many Christians are living in China right now as the fruit of pioneer missionaries that went in, in not, after the, not long after the first wave of, of uh, missionaries into China. And, and when, when they were no longer able to be there, they moved to Taiwan. There's a Lutheran Brethren Church established there as well. After World War II, God put it on the place of the Lutheran Brethren to go to Japan, to a demoralized nation, and bring the gospel to Japan. And currently, there is an established uh, church in Japan, which is very uh, difficult in terms of making an inroad because of the differences between Christianity and, and the kind of entrenched uh, paganism that's, that's part of Japan. But God is working. But the story that, that we're here to think about tonight that is ongoing uh, is, is that in, in, uh, in the early years of the Lutheran Brethren, uh, th that God placed on our heart a, a region of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, along the Shari River, and a little bit to the west in the nation of Cameroon, and then also in the nation of Chad to, to, to go. And so uh, uh, those first pioneer missionaries took families. One who went to Concordia felt the call there. His name was Ralph Fugelstead. He went with his new bride and, and died of black uh, fever after being there only a year as a young couple. So the stories are, 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 some of them are quite dramatic. This is not an easy part of the world to live in. And yet right now there are 10 times as many Lutheran Brethren Christians in Cameroon and Africa as there are in North America. It's a beautiful body of Christ. God continues to call us to be part of that. The Cameroonian church is pretty much self-sufficient. The Southern Chadian church, pretty much self-sufficient. They're sending missionaries. We have fellowship with them. But right now, the Lutheran Brethren has sensed the call of God to take the gospel of Jesus north of the Shari River in Chad, Africa, to an area where there is little established witness church 
uh, of Jesus Christ. There are three people groups, the, the full bay, which we'll hear about tonight, the Begirmi, where there's a wonderful new initiative. It's a school that you can uh, take a look at in the foyer before you go. Um, and, and, and the Narvsons are here tonight to talk about God's heart for the Begirmi. Uh, and, and the Zabotis are, are working, excuse me, the full bay. Thank you. Thank, you got a little restless there. Full bay. And, 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 uh, and then Triumph has had the call to take, we've adopted the Balala people group. This is another people group, uh, their own language group, their own culture. And since 2003, we've been praying and sending and doing what we can do to see the gospel come to the Balala people of Chad. The Holzners were the first uh, pioneer missionaries to the, to the Balala. And more recently, um, uh, Danny and Mandy Bronson were working amongst the Balala. Well, um, I'm not going to say anything more except that th this is really critical in, in, in terms of who we are as a Lutheran brethren. We believe that this is a passion that God has placed on our hearts, and we are so glad tonight to have the Narvisons with us. And uh, they're fresh home right from, from Africa. Um, they, uh, th in fact, is this your, is this your, like, your rookie preaching assignment, Dave? Yeah, your, yeah so this is, so, huh? This is your first shot? This is a great group to have your first shot. They are going to be awesome to listen to tonight. So, uh, Dave, would you come up, please? Welcome to Sonia and kids. Yeah, so first shot. We'll see how this goes. No, uh, it is a pleasure to be here today uh, to share a little bit with you about just our mission, uh, just our world mission to Chad. What we do, uh, when Pastor Jeff first talked to me, you know, talk about the call, what it's, what it's like, you know, the transformative power of what we do over there. And um, I thought about that a little bit and said, yeah, I, I can do that. Because these are questions I really had to figure out for myself. Uh, um, I, I went to North Dakota State University for engineering way back in the day. Um, was an engineer for about eight years before being called to seminary. So most of my life was hiding behind a calculator. And so th then I get this call to, from God, you know, what am I going to, how am I going to do this? How am I going to go overseas and be a missionary? What does that entail? What does that entail for our church? And so these last four years have been really formative, I think, just for us as a family as we've moved forward. And uh, for myself, as I just uh, have thought through this these questions of how, what does it mean to uh, be a missionary? And it I hopefully it applies to you guys too, just here um, in Moorhead and in Fargo, and then as we move out from that bubble. So as I speak to you today, I really want you to come away with uh, three things and in order of s significance. First, I hope you hear God's word and understanding just how meaningful and powerful it is and how freeing the gospel is. Really, that's why we're here, how freeing the gospel is. Uh, I also want you just to have a better understanding of a missionary. What does that, who, who does God call to be missionaries? And then how does that apply to us here in the U.S. and also overseas as we go out? And I also hope you come away just knowing with what, what is it our church does in Africa, especially as I know that very well now. Um, and so... To go through that, I'll be preaching today from Luke uh, 24. I'll be starting from verse 13. And just to start up, if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. Just to sort of, uh, just kind of set the stage. Luke 24 really is broken into three parts. The kind of, and it's all revelation. If you think of a treasure box, you know how you see in the movies, like they just sort of crack the treasure box open and the, the light just kind of shines out from it. And then they bring it, wider, and the light shines even more, and then they get the full experience when they open that treasure. That's how Luke 24 really acts. The first segment is the two women who go to the grave, and they go to the grave, and they don't find Jesus. And instead, they find these angels that tell them Jesus is alive, and it's like the crack opening. And so then Luke moves on to the Emmaus Road description where we'll be talking from next. When he really starts to open this up, what does this mean? There's no, nobody's in the, in the grave. Jesus is not there anymore. And so we'll read from Luke 24, uh, starting in 13, um, on the Emmaus Road, as 
there's these two people discussing what, what's, what's all happening. So, now the same day, the two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked among them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, Cleopas, Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one, he was going to be the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since this all took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came to us and told us what they had seen, a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. There's a mystery here, and it surrounds the question of not only where is Jesus, but who is this person of Jesus? Who is this person of Jesus? Oftentimes, I don't think we really grapple with this question question enough because we live in, when we live in this Christian bubble that we have, we have our churches, and this is good. We live in our Christian bubbles, and we, we really don't grapple with the question of who is Jesus. If somebody asks you that, well, that's simple. That's, he's, our, he's my Savior. I mean, we can think of the catechism, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he he descended into hell, and on the third day, he rose again and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I mean, that's Jesus, right? He's our Savior. He's our Redeemer. And and as simple as this may seem, when we when we start to move outside of these bubbles, our Christian bubble, our church family, when we move outside of these spaces, we're confronted in this question in ways we often don't think we would be confronted, or uh, how should I put this? We're confronted with this, this question, and the devil, being who he is, really, really pushes on this in ways we aren't expecting. He, he, he starts to move our understanding away from the central location of Jesus as Savior and Redeemer, and, and he catches us sometimes, especially in how we relate to other people. So now for these two guys walking on the road to Emmaus, they were wrestling with this too. Who, who was Jesus? Really, in the whole crossroads of all history, you know, Jesus had just raised from the dead, and they didn't know. So who was the Jesus? They knew this man. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed. He had been sentenced to death and crucified. You know, that's stated. These facts are stated. But then they move, move past these facts, and they start to get into this world of doubt, and this doubt really seeps into them. They had hoped that he would redeem Israel. You know, it's, it's no longer a fact like the first things I said. This, this is this doubt. He was supposed to redeem, but, but now he's dead. How can a man who is dead supposed to redeem? And so then they keep going even further down into just complete mystery, like disbelief. But somebody said that he's alive. What, what is this? So it's this mystery as, as missionaries, as Christians, as we move outside the context, or context of being here in church, that we confront people with any unbelieving person we come in contact with. We confront them with this, who is Jesus? Who is he? It's a mystery for people who don't know him. Now, people who don't know Jesus, they're all over. I mean, this, uh, what, what's your uh, hearts, hearts, homes? Hearts, home cities. Hearts, home cities, nations. It's great, great. It just shows how it's a ripple effect. 
You know, people who don't know Jesus, they can be our next door neighbors, they can be our family, they can be our coworkers, fellow students, they're everywhere. And now, now in a context like here in America, oftentimes there's, we have these bubbles of like worldview and, and they're almost always perfectly matched. Now, sometimes they aren't. I mean, we have divisions in this country, so, you know, they might think a little bit more over here of this and maybe not so much over here of that from how we perceive things. But there's always similar. We speak almost always the same language, which, trust me, is a blessing I have learned. This is, this is really nice to be able to speak to people in English about Jesus. And, um, and so... And so we get, to, we get to learn about these people, but there's always similarities. We connect with these people, and it's great. Now, one of, being a missionary overseas, and really a missionary, the, the definition, I think that best defines it, is someone really who is sent far away. Because like we read in Matthew 28, you know, Jesus calls all of us. As Christians, we are all called to go and preach the gospel to those across the street, to gr- those across the cubicle, everywhere. But now the church also does this thing where where a church can come together and send people far, far away. And that's what the Church of the Lutheran Brethren has done from the get-go in the very start. And so the church, all of you guys, have called us a part of the church to go to this place a far, far away, away in Africa, in like middle of the nowhere Chad, which is really middle of the nowhere Africa to begin with. And so when we confront these people, who don't know Jesus, their worldviews are like night and day. It's different. It's different there in so many ways, but we've gotten to know them. And so I want to set a little bit of time just introducing you to the full day people and just, just so you can know how to maybe pray for them a little better and just know what their life is like. This is a good friend of mine. Um, his name's Ishane. He He's a farmer, like most people in my village. They're all farmers, and, and they all farm by hand. You can see that little hoe on his back. That's what he works with every day during, during far planting season, rainy season when it comes. He goes out. He has about five acres, give or take, and it, he plants it. All, he clears it all by hand with that little hoe. He goes out and plants it, and then he has to weed it with that little hoe. They call it... They, they even have this thing they call the, the three hoeings, I guess you could go. So you start at one end of your field, and for like three or four weeks, you go through the whole field, just hoeing away, and they're short. So he's, always, he's down on the ground like this, just going like this for all the morning until the heat gets to him. Then he goes home. He goes back the next day. He finishes up the field, and by that time, the other end of the field needs it again. So he goes back, and he, he just starts over again, and goes and goes and goes and goes. I did this with him one day. I laid down for about three days while he goes out every morning and does this. But he's a nice guy. He plants peanuts and millet, and that's what he lives on for the entire year. He's he's got a wife, and um, he's had four children. Sadly, two of them have passed away, This one this past year. And that's what he does. Uh, I unfortunately don't have too many pictures of women. Um, But women, they stay at home. They stay at home, and they cook, and they watch kids, and they get ready to cook some more. Um, millet, I don't know if it's this little hard stuff or sorghum they use a lot. They have to grind it every day by hand. And so all day in the village, you just hear this thunk, 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 thunk. And it's just the women just pounding grain, pounding grain, pounding grain, so that it becomes kind of like a flour so that they can cook it, so that their whole families can eat and then they do that again every day. That's, that's really what their job is. This here is a, villi- um, is a picture of a nomad camp, and that's the, the lady's kitchen, I believe. Um, so this is her kitchen, her dream kitchen out in, the, out in the, the bush of Chad. The full bay, not only are they farmers, they actually are originally cattle people. They, they, the full bay range all the way from Senegal all the way out to the un- other end of Africa, um, in the Sahel, which is just like this, not jungle, not desert, kind of in between. And so they know cows. They love their cows. And so a lot of them are still nomads. And so these are some friends of ours who live out in the bush, and they just kind of move around our village all year long, depending on where the grass is good. Um, and we go out and visit them on occasion. This is their cows. 
They're zebukas. They have these huge horns. And so oftentimes you'll just be going on walks out in the bush and you'll see these little shepherd boys, you know, like eight or ten years old with these huge sticks chasing after cows, just whapping away at them to get them to go where they are needing to go. And you just wonder, how, how are you still alive? Because those cows are huge. But this is what they do. This is how they live. Um, oftentimes, they can run into things unexpected that we wouldn't think unexpected. This here is a friend of mine. He he's decided, you know what? He doesn't want to farm. He still farms because he has to. This is actually his peanut field. And on the other side of the fence, he's trying to start an orchard. He's got some mango trees, some uh, guava trees. Does he have? He's got some banana trees as well. He, he's trying to get this guava started, but or these, this orchard started started. Um, but the problem is just animals are everywhere. So he made this huge fence, goes all the way around it. And then he called me up one morning. He said, Dave, you, you need to come take pictures because the elephants walked through my field last night. And so you can see the fence is laid over from the elephant that just decided he didn't care about the fence and took it out. Um, and this is just how they live every day. It's hard. It seems hard. It's not like he can just call up the insurance agent and say, well, I had an elephant walk through my field last night. You know, what am I going to do? Um, but that's just, that's just kind of their life in Chad. It's just working. And when it gets hot, they like to lay around um, because there's nothing much you can do when it's 120 degrees out. And so it's fun to just get to know how they live, how they just are as a family, um, but they also want to know about America too. And so we sit on mats a lot and we talk and we drink the sweet tea that's hot and it's just a good time. The guys are all just wanting to know what's America like. And they always, America is just money to them. You know, if I can get to America, I got it made. And so they'll ask me, Dave, Dave, you know, can I, um, can I get to America? If I get to America, can I get a job in the fields. You know, I got my hoe. I know how to hoe. Can I go out there and make some money to send back to my family? Like, no, no, you, you can't do that because they have tractors. And so they're like, okay, okay. Well, cows, we know cows. Um, how about, you know, they got, somebody's got to keep them in line and chase them around. I said, well, the bush in America, there's really no bush like there is in Chad. They have fences for their cows that keep them inside. And they go, oh, okay. Okay, I guess we can't do that. But, but they go, milk. Do people in America drink milk? I said, yes, we love milk in America. Great, I can milk a cow. I will go and I will milk cows in America and I will make money. In it. And I have to look at them. I'm like, sorry, they have machines for that too. And their mind is just kind of, poof, and, it's, and they just, it's just different. Our worldviews are different in ways that we can't even uh, imagine. And so now, now we need to talk about God. What is God to them? Remember this whole, we, we come into contact with these people about who is Jesus. Now the question of God is also a big one too. And Islam, we hear a lot about Islam on the news and radio. I, you know, I've been out of America for a while, so I don't know what all is said these days. But when you interact with Muslim people and you really get to know them, it really comes down to two things. It comes down to obedience, and it comes down to the sovereignty of God. Obedience and the sovereignty of God. Their obedience actually brings them to live what looks like a really good life. When I first started living among them, I oftentimes thought to myself, what, what would people react? How would they react if I, I said to them, you know, I'm, I'm being sent to a people who live communally. They live together all the time. They pray together every day, like five times. They don't drink alcohol. They don't smoke. They don't steal. They don't swear. I mean, how would, how would people react to that? And it really even got to the point where I'm thinking, why am, these people are so nice. Why am I really here? And then I realized that my perception of who Jesus is had really started the devil. He had sneaky. He, he started to move that away from Jesus as a redeemer to Jesus as an example. And so when we 
we move Jesus as this example that will live up to, well, that's like an impossible thing to do, to live up to the standard that Jesus set on this earth. And when I saw how these people were doing it better than I do, I'm thinking to myself, why am I here? And so then I said, no, this, this isn't right. This isn't right. I'm here for Jesus as a redeemer who, who can take away the sins of their world. And so then, we need, so then I realized I need to relate to these people about Jesus. So we need to confront what they think of Jesus. And really, in, in Islam, we're kind of ahead of the game because we don't have to convince them of the fact that Jesus was a prophet, that he even existed in this world. And so if you go in my village and you ask just about anyone, who is Jesus? They'll give you this answer. It's almost the same all the time. They say, Jesus, he was a great prophet. They say, we know that man, he lived a perfect life. We know that he was condemned to die on the cross. But, and it's a really big but, they said he was so good that God didn't want him to die. So as he was on the cross, before he died, he took him up into heaven with him. And now Jesus is living with God in heaven. And at the end of times, Jesus is going to come back to this earth where he's going to judge everybody. He's going to have his kingly reign for seven years. It's going to be great and perfect. And then Jesus is going to die. And there's blessings and there's hardships because there's so much that's so close to what we believe. But then there's so much that's missing. The Jesus as a redeemer. That oftentimes our differences of who Jesus is is just kind of gets brushed away. So, so how, do, how do we confront that as missionaries in Africa? How do, we, how do we bring them to this understanding as Jesus, as Lord? And so I think there we'll continue on with the, with the immense road and see how Jesus confronts this question because Jesus, he's here with these guys trying to ask about, well, who is this Jesus guy? And so, <clears throat> continuing on in verse 25, Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with him. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven, and those who were with them assembled together. It's one of my favorite lines in all of Scripture. We're not our hearts burning within us. Well, he talked with us on the road and opened Scriptures to us. Jesus does something amazing here. I mean, how many of us, if you had come back to the from the dead, and your friends were sitting talking about, well, who is this man? And it was you. Wouldn't just want to like raise your hand and be like, it's me. I'm here. But he doesn't give them that. He gives them scripture. And not only when we think about who is Jesus, we think of Jesus, well, let's look at the New Testament. He uses the Old Testament, starting with Moses and the prophets. And he guides them through the show that he is a redeemer who needs to suffer for our sins. So this is good because in Africa, they know all the prophets. They love the prophets. They're all named after the prophets. And so, so I can give them scripture. When, one of the, they have Ramadan, the celebration of Ramadan, which you've probably heard of. Um, but that's a hard, they suffer during Ramadan. But they have this celebration that's like Christmas for them. And the celebration is a big celebration of when Abraham, they say Ishmael, we talk, we discuss this, but when Abraham brings Isaac, 
to the mountain, and God gives him a ram. And so, so the, as like the weeks upcoming, they all ask me, the literal translation is, so Dave, are you, are you going to buy a ram and slit its throat? Are you going to buy a ram and slit its throat? Because it's just so exciting for everybody to buy a ram and eat it. It's Christmas for them. And so this year I did it. I bought a ram. This was our poor ram. He was delicious. But I, I, I got to take, I didn't need a whole ram for our family. There was other there's other poor people in our town too. So we took it, we, we butchered him. And then I, I got to go out and I got to give chunks of meat to people and talk about, you know what? They really focus on the obedience of Abraham. He brought his son to be sacrificed. How amazing was that? They love obedience. That was so amazing. I said, yes, but the point of the story isn't the obedience of Abraham, but the grace of God that something could suffer in the place of his son. And so we, point, we start to point to Jesus, this, this, per, this Jesus who had to suffer for the redemption of our sins. And as we look at Luke 24, he really opens that up again when he says to the people, this is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be filled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds. He's using scripture again. He opens their minds with scripture and tells them, this is what was written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. As a missionary, I used to put so much law on myself, so much pressure on myself, I must, I must figure out a way to bring Jesus to them in a way that's convincing. I must bring Jesus to them in a way that they'll go, oh yeah, that's what I need. But the gospel is not only freeing for us as, as sinners and taking away that, the burden of our sin. He, Jesus, through scriptures, also takes away the burden of proclaiming his name. So much of the time I think we get wrapped up, we need to make Christians. But that's, that's not what our job, Jesus does not call us to go out and make Christians. He goes out and tells us to proclaim his name in his word. And when his name is proclaimed and his name is given, he opens people's minds. He does the work. He makes believers for himself. And so what do we do in Africa as, as I, you know, getting through this? First of all, we sit and we eat with him. Both, in both these second halves of Luke, uh, second, well, Anyway, these last two parts of Luke, Jesus sits down and he eats with these people. He relates to them. So we sit and we eat with them. We live our lives with them. This is Sonia with a good friend of hers. And one of the ways we live lives with them, Africa is hard. It is hard. And we get to share their joys, but we also share in their sufferings, which is really hard. I'm not really good at sharing in people's sufferings. My wife, on the other hand, she is. We had, we had this point in time this last year where like six or seven kids in like two weeks died, all under the age of like three. They would go from healthy to dead just like that. It was hard. And there's, what do you do? But, but we share these, our lives with them, and we share this suffering. Them. Sonia would go over and she'd just cry with the moms. We share our lives, their lives, and we share their hope. We share our hope in Jesus. She has another good friend um, who's really old, and, and she's, she said to Sonia, you know, I'm just, I'm scared of dying. I'm scared of dying. Hard questions. So we share our hope. She can't read our language is still very minimal, but God has given us ways. We have little recorders, and so Sonia was able to like even show her a video, the Jesus Film Project, if you've ever heard of it. She showed her a video of our hope. She, as we left to come back here, she gave them a little recorder with, that had solar panels to charge the batteries so that she could listen to what her hope is in Jesus. And we, we share scripture with them. Many of you have heard the well projects that we do. Um, 
we don't do the well, we do the wells to help them. That's what we want. But we also use the wells to give them scripture. Here's uh, Dan Benberg, uh, the director of missions um, at a well project. Kind of in the middle of that picture in the back is a Chadian pastor, Pastor Malum, that we, I work with a lot. Um, the Balala, they have Pastor Niso. Pastor Niso with the Balala does this a ton. He goes, he makes wells in Balala villages, and he shares scripture with them. We share scripture. And then we get to see the results. Sometimes. Not all the time. And a lot of times, we don't. Um, for me, probably the biggest, most impactful time I had this in sharing scripture um, was through st- sharing of the prophet Noah, through N- Noah and the flood. I had learned this in Full Bay, and I was reading it to my friend. I have a friend who really loves to just hear all the prophets and all the stories. And so I was sharing with him about the prophet Noah. And I, so we talked about the flood, and we talked about how the animals came, and how, you know, God gave Noah the ark, and how the ark just rescued these people. And they, they were kept from the destruction of the water, and then they found earth, and they were given life. And I said to him, you know, I went off script in full play, and so it didn't come out this great. But I said, you know, this is what Jesus is for us. Our hearts are like the evil that was in the world before the flood. It's bad, and it needs to be washed clean. And I said, if we were present in that washing, we would just be destroyed like everything else was on this earth. But Jesus, he is our Savior. And he is our ark. And as we are baptized into Jesus, he lifts us above these destroying waters. And he carries us over them until they go away. And our hearts are left clean in that. And so my friend just kind of stares off into the distance for a while. And I'm thinking, oh man, I said that really bad. And so I looked at him, do you understand? He goes, oh yeah, I'm thinking. The word of God, it opens hearts. It opens and it burns. I really believe I started to see some fire going on in that man's life. So how can you pray, specifically speaking in terms of Chad? Um, Pray for workers. Pray for more missionaries. Chad is a hard place. I mean, the Bronsons leaving, that was like, it was hard for us to see as a team in Chad. I mean, even though we have these different people groups, we're a small mission and we're all like, you know, we have to be together. We need missionaries. People need to hear God's word. <clears throat> pray, for, pray for those of us who are there. Um, we love your prayers on just a daily basis. We love your prayers. And most importantly, just pray for the people who are there, the Balala people. Pray for the Begirmi, the Fulbe, because these people have just no conception of what a suffering Savior is and how he takes away the sins of them, and how, and how that's just so freeing. So really just pray that their hearts would be open to Scripture, that Jesus would just open Scripture in their hearts, and just um, that the, God's Word would just continue and um, be made known to all nations. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this time. Uh, We thank you for the calling you have given all of us just to show your love to the world, to talk about who you are as a Savior who redeems this world. We think of those here in Triumph and Moorhead who need to hear your news that you would make it known and just also for for the wider world, for Chad, for, for Taiwan and Japan and just everywhere else. We just thank you so much for bringing together as a church so that we can support each other and just be with each other in these times. And we just most of all, thank you for giving us your word 
so that when just things don't make sense or seem impossible to comprehend, that we can just go back to that rock of Scripture and just show yourself to everyone around us. Amen. Thanks, Dave. I invite you to rise as you're able, as we respond. And this song was written for a moment just like this. The book of Psalms says that the word of God is a lamp unto our feet. And that means that we only know the next couple steps, not the end of the path. And so as we sing this together, as we respond, I just invite you to say yes to whatever God's calling you to do right now. Who knows, maybe the next missionary to Chad is in this room. I pray that we are obedient as we hear the Lord's voice. Kingdom is here. We 
rise to follow. We rise to follow. We rise to follow. Your kingdom is here. Thanks for being with us here tonight. Thanks for being open to what God may be saying to each of us. There's a ministry team here at the church. It's called the World Mission Ministry Team. They meet once a month to pray and seek God for what we can do in terms of supporting His work, especially uh, the work in Chad right now. And, and so if you're interested in that, talk to me or Dan or Jarvis, who's our greeter in the back week after week. Uh, he and his wife, Jean, have a passion for this work. They'd be glad to, to help you process that. Also, there are cards to pray for missionaries, their families, their kids' birthdays, back by the bridge, heading back into the children's wing there by the world map. And you might be prompted to pick up one of those. Anyway, we're glad that you're here tonight. Not all of us can go, but we can give and we can pray. And so we have the privilege of being a part of this. Thanks for coming tonight. Receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have a good evening.